Welcome to class seven. We're talking tonight about translators. So this is an interesting topic because I don't know if you've ever thought about it before. At least for me, you know, textual criticism, some of these things that we've been touching on, there's things that like had entered into my brain. I don't think I'd ever asked myself, oh, who are the translators of the Bible that I've been reading my whole life? It's one of those funny kind of things. Like if somebody asked you, who was one of the translators of the King James? Would you be able to come up with one name? You know, it's funny, isn't it? Like we read this book all the time and, and we're highly influenced by who translated it, but we don't even know who they are, you know, or we don't, we, uh, and in fact, by the way, the King James is kind of hard because there were, there were a lot of translators and the lists that have been compiled are actually different. So, so there's, there's some questions as to who exactly was on the translating committee. Um, and, and then again, like in some cases, translators don't actually want you to know who they are. So that, that's also sort of a funny thing, like the, the New American Standard Bible, um, that, was, that was translated here in California. But at the beginning, the translators didn't tell anyone who they were. So the New American Standard Bible just didn't have any translator names attached to it. So it's, it's an interesting sort of thing trying to understand about the translators, but I think it's helpful for us to spend some time on it because they have a big impact on what we read. Now, what we are really going to be doing tonight is looking at the value of diversity in translations and in translators. So what I mean is different translating committees bring different things to the table. So different translating committees are going to open up different possibilities different individuals are going to open up different possibilities as opposed to a committee. And so what we want to do is recognize that and with that knowledge, then say, well, why don't I consult a translation that was by an individual? Now, why don't I consult one that was by a committee? Now, let me consult one with a more homogenous committee, a committee where there's less diversity. And to just know what we're getting into. I think that's, that's the biggest piece of this. I'm not going to come out and say, you know, this is better than this. I think the key is for us to look at them all and to have knowledge of what it is that we're looking at. So let's take a look. The plan is to talk about the kind of influence a committee can have, what's positive and negative about it, and then to talk about how diversity can impact what it is that we are reading. So those are the three sections. And what I'm going to suggest to you is that translation benefits from diversity. And that's, you know, that's really just like basically everything in life because diversity opens up the possibility for ideas that we might not ever have considered. And so that's the case with translation, that I might work on a passage on my own, which is fine. You know, I have extra flexibility if I do that, but... There are interpretations, there are translations that I might not think of that could be totally legitimate and helpful translations. So let's just consider why does diversity matter when translating? I'm not just trying to use it because, you know, it's one of those key words or words that gets thrown around all the time. I really think it's a beneficial thing when it comes to the Bible. So let's take a look at this. Translators are usually not on our radar. But their decisions have a significant impact, so I think we need to spend some time learning about them. Let's consider how this works. In a committee, one of the things that's fascinating about a committee, and you've likely run into this when you've been on a committee, is that the majority typically rules. It's rare to look for consensus on a committee. So the majority usually rules, and the benefit that that gives is minority viewpoints can be expressed. They might not be viewpoints that anybody else would have considered. So that's a positive because new ideas get to be considered. And then it's also positive because you get feedback from a lot of different people. Now, it can also be negative because maybe that minority viewpoint is good and right, 
but it gets suppressed by the majority if the majority disagrees. So let me just show you a little bit of how this can work with first an individual translation and then a committee translation. So this is my translation of Jonah 1. Um, I am slowly compiling a translation of the Old Testament. <laughs> and by, by slowly, I mean, probably, I'm probably averaging something like a chapter every few weeks. So, you know, who knows exactly when we'll be done. Maybe someday I'll, uh, I'll retire and do it full time. <laughs> That's probably a long way in the future, though. So, so this is my translation of Jonah 1. And what you will see here is I was able to put in whatever I thought made the most sense. So I'm going to highlight some things for you as we read through this. Jonah 1 verses 1 to 4 in the, I've, I've since um, called this translation the HDT, the Hensley Dynamic Translation. So here's, here's uh, how that would read, Jonah 1 verses 1 to 4. Now the word of Yahweh came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. Get up and go at once to Nineveh, the great city, and cry out to it that its inhabitants' calamity has risen before me. Jonah got up from before Yahweh in order to flee to Tarshish. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the ships higher and went down into it in order to come with them towards Tarshish from before Yahweh. Simultaneously, Yahweh flung a mighty wind toward the sea. A great tempest came in the sea. The ship considered breaking apart. Okay, so let's take a look. I was able to translate this how I thought was the best. So what I ended up doing is this verb here, get up and got up, same word in the Hebrew. So I therefore decided to translate it the same way both times. The reason for that is as I was translating, I noticed there's this like directional sense going on here in Jonah 1, the first few verses, eventually ending up with Jonah all the way down in the pit or in Sheol. So he's told, go up, go up, and he just keeps going down, down, down. So I wanted to bring that out in the translation. So I want to point that out to you now, because as we look at some committee translations, we're going to see that they didn't do that. So I was able to show this directional idea. In addition to that, if you look at other translations, you might see that they say, cry out against it. So cry out against Nineveh, that its wickedness has risen before me. I decided to take this a different way, uh, particularly because I felt that, you know, it didn't, it didn't make sense that Jonah wouldn't want that job. You know, to be able to go and condemn Nineveh, that seems like that's what he was waiting for. You know, what he really wanted. He wanted to come and say, you're all going to, you know, perish, that kind of thing. But the Hebrew could also read like this, cry out to it that its inhabitants' calamity has risen before me. In other words, God's saying, I see your suffering, and I want to help you. I want to do something about it. But first, you have to repent. That would be a message that Jonah really would not want to deliver. And I think it explains why Jonah leaves. So that was my decision as far as the translation goes. So that's how I translated it. In addition to that, you have a lot of action words. Yahweh flung a mighty wind towards the sea. It's not just he made a wind happen. The Hebrew specifically says he threw it at the sea. And then a great tempest came in the sea. You can just, you can see the very strong imagery here. So much so that it says the ship considered breaking apart. And that is literally what the Hebrew says. The ship thought about breaking. So this is very much, you know, a lot of commentators look at this and they say, yeah, this doesn't make any sense. Ships don't think, right? But that's what the Hebrew says. The ship thought about falling apart. So you have these ideas up, down, the inhabitants calamity, and you have this personification going on at the end. Let's take a look at the King James. Let's see if they preserve that. So we'll look at the up, down idea. We're going to see the inhabitants calamity, and we're going to look for the personification of the ship at the end. So here we go. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. 
Jonah rose up to flee into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. He found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. So you can see that the King James pretty much preserves those ideas of get up and down. Although arise and rose up, it doesn't use the same words um, in the English to show that it's the same word in the Hebrew, but you can still see the directional movement, right? going on in the King James. Now, they very much put the wickedness on Nineveh, which, you know, Nineveh was a wicked place, and it's a totally legitimate translation. But you miss out on that sense of God's also offering mercy. Okay. And so that the ship was like to be broken. Well, I don't know. That doesn't really show the personification. It is kind of a strange way of writing English. So you can kind of tell like the translators were wrestling with what do we do here? <laughs> because nobody talks that way. So that the ship was like to be broken. You know, you might expect somebody to say likely to be broken, but it's, it feels like you can, you can sense the wrestling that they had with the personification of the ship. Here's the NIV. Again, we're going to look for the directions, the inhabitants, calamity, and the personification of the ship. We have the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. So, you will notice the direction stuff is just totally gone in the NIV. It says, go. He ran away, he went down, he went to board. The only directional words that are preserved is when he goes down to Joppa, and that's it. Preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. So they go with the whole idea of Nineveh's wickedness. And then you do get the personification of the ship. So that the ship threatened to break up. Now, obviously, because I translated it, I like my translation the best. Okay, now, now, my point, though, is when you have an individual, that individual can translate the way that they want. It's highly probable that on translation committees for these Bibles, these ideas that I put in my translation were brought up and shot down because people said, or the majority said, eh, you know, we don't agree with that. So my point is, is that it's helpful to look at both because translations by individuals allow them to bring out things that might be silenced by a committee. And translations by committees allow you to see what the majority of scholars on that committee think was right. Okay. Now, here's another example of that. This one doesn't have to do with my translation. This is an example with the NIV. So take a look at this verse. This is a verse that we might be familiar with in terms of talking about the origins of the Lord Jesus. It says, but thou Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel. We want to pay attention to this last part. Whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Okay that very much makes it sound like the Lord Jesus has existed forever. New American Standard. You'll notice at the end, his times of coming forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Again, makes the Lord Jesus sound like he's been around forever. Consider the ESV, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Now that's a little different. Ancient days, not eternity. Here's the NIV. Whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Again, a little bit different, right? So, where did that come from? Well, this is from translation committees. So, let's take a look. Now, if you've ever read Green's literal version, it's often abbreviated as the LITV. Uh, Green was a big uh, anti-new versionist. 
So he really did not like new versions. He wrote this book called The Gnostics, The New Versions, and the Deity of Christ. And his argument is that basically all modern translations attempt to destroy the deity of Jesus. Kind of an interesting argument, considering that some, some people within our community would argue the other way. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I kind of find it fascinating that he, he put this book together. This is something that he says, though, about this passage and the newer versions, like the ESV and the NIV. In this Old Testament passage, once again, you see these new versionists denying the eternal existence of the God-man, right? Because they said his origins were from ancient days, not everlasting, but making him to have origins. But Jesus is God and God has no origin. It is evident how much new versionists like to add words and to ignore Hebrew words, as you will see by the bracketed words above, the X is denoting words not translated. What spirit is abroad which constrains men to use words that rob the God-man of his internal existence? So his point here is that new versions attempt to take away the pre-existence of Jesus. Interestingly, uh, that's, you know, his theory. Um, interestingly, the words here that he's arguing about are these mi yame olam. Controversial word is really the word olam, uh, which could be translated as forever or ancient. You can see that sense here a few of the times that this word olam is used. Next is 21 verse 6. This is what would happen when a slave decides that they love their master and they want to stay in their master's house says there, then his master shall bring him unto the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or into the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl. He shall serve him forever. And that's that word, olam. Now, that does not mean that when the servant says, I love my master, I'm going to get my ear bored through, that the servant is now going to serve this master for all eternity. That's not what it's saying. When it says forever, it means for his lifetime, for a long time but not all eternity. Exodus 31, verses 16 and 17, same thing. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. That's that word, olam. This doesn't mean that the Sabbath is going to last forever and ever and ever. It means that the Sabbath was going to last for a long time. 1 Kings 2, verse 45 King Solomon shall be blessed. The throne of David shall be established before the Lord forever. Again, there was a time when the throne of David was not established before the Lord from the time of Solomon, right? So this word olam doesn't always mean eternity. So the translation that the newer translations have given of Micah 5 verse 2, that ancient days, that's a fine translation. There's not an issue with that. In fact, this is Rabbi Joseph Albo one of the most well-known Spanish rabbis. This is what he said about the word olam. Nor can any evidence be found in the expressions eternity. He's, he was a, uh, a rabbi from the Middle Ages, by the way. Eternity, unto eternity, a statute for eternity, or to eternity. For these expressions and their like are also applied to a limited and not an infinite time. Thus we read, remove not the ancient landmark, which thy fathers have set. The word, solam, eternity, is here used to denote a limited time and dating from the father. Okay. Now, why did the newer versions actually decide to translate the way that they did in Micah 5 verse 2? This is a book called Accuracy Defined and Illustrated. It is by Ken Barker. Ken Barker was one of the NIV translators, and he goes through each controversial passage in the NIV and explains why the committee translated it the way that they did. So, you know, I, I feel like Jay Green would have done a lot better just asking the committee, why did you translate it this way, rather than, you know, saying, aha, see, this is their bias and blah, 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 all that kind of thing. So instead, here's what Ken Barker says. The NIV translators were not careless in the handling of Old Testament messianic prophecies or of any other doctrines, but good, godly, spiritual scholars differ on the interpretation of certain biblical passages. Right? We know that. We agree. For example, the Hebrew text at the end of this verse can be translated either, number one, 
whose goings out are from of old, from days of eternity, or whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Those who prefer the first rendering naturally use it to argue for the eternity of the Messiah. Those who prefer the second translation believe that the expression refers to the ancient origins of the Messiah in the line of David, as indicated in the Davidic covenant of 2 Samuel 7. So we, we understand it as referring to the prophecies and in the tribe of Judah, Genesis 49, verse 10. The majority of the Committee on Bible Translation felt that the context favored the second view, Bethlehem of Judah. Out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel. Note the emphasis on the origins of the future Davidic ruler in the Davidic town of Bethlehem. So his point is, the NIV Translation Committee, even though they were Trinitarians and they believed clearly in the pre-existence of Jesus, they said the context makes this sound like it's focusing on the fulfillment of the Davidic promises. So therefore, those promises didn't exist for all eternity. So therefore, we chose the word ancient. So we put the second rendering in the text and the first one in the footnotes as an alternative. Incidentally, those who favor the second translation still believe in the eternity of the Messiah and so in the eternal son of God and believe that his eternality is clearly taught in other passages, particularly in the New Testament. Okay, so he explains where they came up with their idea. So committees can silence legitimate translations. The NIV and the ESV were able to bring out that idea of ancient days, but the NASB didn't. The King James didn't. So what's that mean for us then if we use a committee translated Bible? Well, like so many things in translations, or maybe I should just say like so many things in life, <laughs> the, the answer is not straightforward. Committees have positives and negatives. And so I think the best thing for us is to just be informed of the Bible that we're reading, this was translated by a committee. Or the Bible that we're reading, this was translated by an individual. And to use different ones. So these are the two advantages of committees that we're gonna talk about now. They guard against bias, but the majority rules. So in that sense, they're also biased. But they're able to consider a lot of opinions. Here's a few others, but we're not gonna talk about these. There's more opportunity to catch error with a committee because you have a lot of people looking at it, right? And they're also likely more up to date with scholarship because again, there's a lot of people involved. The disadvantages is that there's less consistency. Um, so I don't know if you were aware, were aware, the King James was translated by numerous committees. And so there's a lack of consistency in some portions of the King James because you know, one committee worked on Kings, another committee worked on Isaiah and they, they didn't work together. So you get this kind of thing where they don't always mesh together. Majority rules with committees. So if the majority doesn't like the minority idea, well, then the minority idea just disappears. We want to talk about those two main ideas, though, guarding against bias and the ability to consider many opinions. And I want to show you some examples of how this works. So committees are able to guard against individual bias, cultural bias, religious bias, ethnic bias, a lot of different things, and they can consider many opinions. Some committees are better at this than others are, and that's where the diversity comes into play. Diversity can really help a committee to consider different opinions. So they can consider the minority opinions, um, whereas you know an individual might not ever even think about it, right? And they can have multiple scholars weigh those opinions. So having a diverse committee is really good because the diversity means that you're more likely to get some of those minority opinions. So let me show you what I mean. Um, women on a translation committee. So there are certain things that women are perhaps more likely to notice. So let me give you some examples of those things. Ephesians 3 verses 4 and 5. Take a look at gender in this passage. You might not even notice it, you know, because we're so used to this. Whereby, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. I don't know if you saw the gender there. Here it is in the ESV, see if you notice it here. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, 
which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the spirit. Here's Young's literal. Again, same thing. Look for the gender. In regard to which you're able, reading it, to understand my knowledge in the secret of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it was now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the spirit. So all three of these translations refer to the sons of men having revelations. Sons of men having revelations. Now, if you're not familiar with the Bible, and we are familiar with it, you know, we're, we're fairly well versed as a community. We recognize there were prophetesses in the Old Testament. There were women who had revelation. But if you weren't familiar with it and you just read this passage in Ephesians, you might get the impression that the revelation of God was solely given to men, always and forever. You might. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, I'm, I'm, trying, I'm not trying to like give an opinion on this. I'm just trying to present what possibilities there are so that you can see why certain women translators have said, you know, we don't need to say it this way. And the reason that they say that is, here's your Greek in Ephesians 3 verse 5. It says, huios ton anthropon, which could be translated as sons of men. It's a fine translation in the Greek. Could also be translated as children of people, which, uh, you know, that, that's an okay translation in the Greek, but it sure does sound weird in English. <laughs> right, right. It was given to children of people. That sounds kind of strange. So maybe a better translation, if you wanted to be more general, would be humanity or humans. So the New American Standard, instead of saying sons of men, says, Mankind, which sounds more inclusive than sons of men, as though it includes women. The new revised standard goes further and says it was not made known to humankind. Now, you might say, well, that's just, you know, splitting hairs. And yeah, it is. I agree. But is it more accurate to say humankind? I think it probably is in this case, just because what Paul is saying is nobody knew. He's not trying to say no men knew. <laughs> and, and so what, what we want people to come out of when they read Ephesians 3 verse 5 is this idea that no one, men and women, knew before. Now, sons of men accomplished that, probably for the most part. But there's probably some people who would read that and think it was only talking about men. <laughs> Here's, here's another instance in Ephesians chapter four, just later, take it, check out the gender. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. He gave gifts to men. ESV says the same thing. He gave gifts to men. Young's literal says the same thing. He gave gifts to men. Again, if you were reading this and you didn't have a strong Bible background, you could get the impression that only men were given gifts of the Holy Spirit, particularly in the time period that this is referring to, which is looking back at the time of Exodus. And then Paul's quoting it in regard to their time now. So that wouldn't be accurate if you got that impression that it was solely to men. Now, this word in the Greek, anthropois, translates to men or people, men and women. So a more accurate translation would probably be, he gave gifts to his people, like what the NIV says. New RSV, again, says the same thing. He gave gifts to his people. Now, I'm not trying to like, you know, create a platform or something to say, oh, you know, our, our stance towards roles or any of these kind of things is wrong. Like, I'm not, I'm not trying to do that. All I'm trying to do is talk about translation, okay? So, so please don't read into this more than what I'm saying. My, my point is just... When we're translating, we don't want people to misunderstand what the original intention of the passage was. And so we can benefit from talking to people who might think about this kind of thing more. And my thought is, I think a, a woman is more likely to say, well, you know, people might misunderstand this passage. You might want to say people instead. Okay, so here's an example of somebody who did that. 
This lady, Suzanne McCarthy, says, why is the same Greek expression translated as sons of men in some places in the ESV and translated in other places as children of men? So sons versus children. The fact that the ESV vacillates between sons of men and children of man is odd since the Greek remains the same in every case. Clearly, a decision was made to translate a Greek expression that normally includes both men and women as men only when the context includes apostles, prophets, teachers, and pastors. This is her opinion. I'm not necessarily sure that that's correct. You know, I don't, I don't think that she should try and infer motives from the ESV translators, but that's her idea that the ESV translators contextually decided, oh, this is referring to apostles, it's referring to prophets. We're going to translate it as being masculine, even though the Greek could also include women. However, when it comes to the forgiveness of God, then the exact same term was translated as children of man, which includes women. In the ESV, the English text seems to be carefully managed so that certain offices and roles in the church appear to be restricted to men only. Interesting. Here's another example. 1 Peter 1.21, King James says, Prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost. Holy men of God, right? Men spoke from God, says the ESV. Men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God, says the New American Standard. Well, again, these words don't have to be translated as men. They're the same word that we've been looking at here. It's the word human in Greek. You could just translate it as people, which again is more biblically accurate because there were prophetesses. There were women prophets who spoke the word of God, which is what Peter's talking about here. So the new RSV says men and women moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. I think that's a more accurate translation. Prophecy resulted, here's the message, resulted when the Holy Spirit prompted men and women to speak God's words, which again, I think more accurate translation going along with what's actually being talked about here. Okay. So once again, here's Suzanne McCarthy. She says, once again, in 2 Peter 1.21, the ESV translates the Greek word anthropos, which refers to all human beings as man and men when it relates to prophecy. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Are the translators of the ESV Bible trying to minimize the face or the fact that prophecy was also given to women in both the Old and New Testaments? Are they trying to make prophecy by women appear less worthy of mention? Did only men speak from God or did women also speak from God? The list of female prophets in the Bible include Miriam, Sarah, Deborah, Hannah, Huldah, Anna, Mary, Elizabeth, Prisca, and the daughters of Philip. Now, again, it's not a good idea to infer motives, although she does point out that a majority of the translators or a large group of the ESV Bible translators are on the committee. Uh, it's, it's some kind of committee uh, for, mm, you know what, I'm not going to go into that. I shouldn't because I don't know what I'm, uh, yeah, they're on some committee having to do with, with gender, <laughs> huh, but I'm not, I'm not going to go into it more because I don't remember the term. Okay, so women on translation committees can encourage consideration of those kind of things. So I think diversity is good. It's helpful. The more diversity on a committee, the more possible perspectives. So this is a man named Issa Macaulay, and I want to bring out what he says as someone who's Black in relation to being a Bible translator, because this is now that diverse sense. He says, if the Christian church recognizes that its very diversity testifies to the universal saving power of its message, then it stands to reason that the gifts and insights of various ethnicities can only be a boon to Bible translation. The insight, experience, and skills of female scholars might open our eyes to nuances that a committee of all men might miss. Christians for whom English is a second language might highlight ways in which our word choice is unclear. I totally agree with that. Similarly, black Christians may call to mind neglected aspects of the text. So he says, take a look at this example. Exodus 12, verse 38, a mixed multitude went up also with them, flocks and herds, even very much cattle. And IV just says many other people went up with them. King James says mixed multitude, and IV says many other people. ESV says mixed multitude, and ASB says mixed multitude. What he points out is nearly all scholars agree that the original Hebrew meant or was intended to highlight that an 
ethnically diverse group of people left Egypt with the Jewish people. It wasn't just supposed to be, you know, oh, and some other people came, which I think is how we often read it. The point is, is that this was a group of a lot of different kinds of people. This group could have included Egyptians and other ethnic groups, such as the Kushites. This passage then highlights the African presence among the people of God from the beginning in a way that would be relevant to today's Bible readers. The translation mixed multitude isn't necessarily wrong. It simply does not communicate the power of the simple verse in a way that would be understood by those reading today. If I were translating the passage, I would say that an ethnically diverse crowd went up out of Egypt, but the CEB's diverse crowd gets close enough. So what he says is, you know, as somebody who's used to thinking about ethnic diversity, he says, that's something that I would bring out in the translation because I think that was there. That was the original intention. So something interesting to think about. Here's another one that having a black translator can help. I don't know if you've ever thought about this verse. This is a very... Um, Translations of this verse are not so good. Consider this from the perspective of someone who is black. King James says, I am black, but comely, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kedar, as the curtains of Solomon. Look not upon me because I am black, because the sun hath looked upon me. My mother's children were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but mine own vineyard have I not kept. So King James you know, it's old, so it can kind of be forgiven for some of the ways that it does things. But the ESV says the same thing. I'm very dark, but lovely. Do not gaze at me because I'm dark, because the sun has looked upon me. NIV says dark I am, yet lovely. So do you get the implication here? Even though I'm black, I still look good, right, is essentially what these translations are saying, which is, you know, I, I would feel weird about that, right? I'm Chinese. It would feel weird to read a Bible passage that says, even though I'm Chinese, I'm good looking. And I'd be like, oh, well, you know, thanks. Like, <laughs> that, I appreciate you saying that a Chinese person looks good, but the implication here is that most don't is kind of what it sounds like it's saying here. Now, what's interesting about this is that if you read it in the Hebrew, it doesn't actually say that. So, the default translation of this portion would be, I am black and lovely. Not I am black, but lovely. I am black and lovely. So, Phyllis Isabella Shepherd, this is what she says about this passage. Song of Songs, the text with the most fully portrayed self-identified black woman in the Bible. The text invites theological reflection and thus poses the question of what it means theologically to take seriously one's blackness, gender, social location, and relationship to and with others. Her point is, is that if this passage is understood as saying, I am black and lovely, it's a woman actually declaring, not I'm black, but you know, don't look at me kind of thing. It's I'm black and that's good. Interesting, right? I mean, it totally changes. So you will notice that the New American Standard translates it as, I am black and beautiful. Young's literal says, dark am I and comely. And I think these are things that because we're not black, we probably haven't noticed that before. Now, again, I wanna make this clear. This is why committees exist, because not everybody agrees, right? This is the kind of thing that a committee would hammer out. So I'm not trying to say, you know, one way is better than the other. Again, I'm not trying to take a side here. My point is, is that this is the value of a committee, that somebody on the committee can say, whoa, 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 I'm black, but lovely. You know, I don't feel comfortable with that. And then the committee can talk about it. And somebody like this man, Claude Mariantini, can say, in Hebrew, the conjunction, wow, can be translated as and or but. Many people object to translating the Shunammites, Shulamites words as black but beautiful because such a translation may suggest that blackness is not beautiful. Critics complain that this translation may point to some kind of racial prejudice. 
A careful look at the text reveals that the woman was explaining that although she had a dark complexion, that she was beautiful. So he says, you know, it should say black, but beautiful. Here's why, he says. The reason she spoke about her dark skin was probably because it had become an issue in the minds of people who belonged to the upper class of Jerusalem. So he says, contextually, culturally, it makes sense that she would say that. Verse six explains that her skin was dark because her brothers forced her to work in the vineyards and she was exposed to the hot sun. This is the reason she asked the women of Jerusalem not to look at her and her dark complexion with disdain. The text has nothing to do with race. Neither is the text saying that white skin is more attractive than dark skin. It's just saying, right, that she was out in the sun a lot. So don't look at her and laugh at her because of that. So this is the kind of thing that committees would talk about. And so it's helpful to have a committee in order to do something like that. Diverse committees allow that dialogue to take place. Here's another example of this. This is Jeremiah 13, 23. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. That's a pretty rough verse. Can the Ethiopian change his skin? NIV, can an Ethiopian change his skin or a leopard his spots? ESV, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? New American Standard, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? So you see that a lot of translations have it that way. Can the Ethiopian change his skin? And again, there's the implication here that the Ethiopian wishes he could. Here it is in the Hebrew. Interestingly, here's your verb. Haya ha foch. It is an imperfect plus a question. So there's your hey of questioning. So the way that you would default translate this is not can the Ethiopian change his skin. Your typical translation would be will the Ethiopian change his skin or would the Ethiopian change his skin. You could say can, but your default would typically be will or would. Now each of those translations implies something different, right? Will the Ethiopian change his skin? That's more like, well, he could, but he doesn't want to kind of thing, right? There's a, a sense here that's very different. Can is more like, well, he wishes he could, but he can't, he's stuck with it. So Gosnell York says, this text provides no substantiation for the implication that there's some self-hating desire on the part of both leopard and Ethiopian to change themselves in order to become something or someone else and presumably for the better. And by the way, the reason that people have to state this kind of thing is because these verses have been used to say that, right? They have been used to say, oh, see, you know, people, people like the Ethiopian have this self-hatred. They wish they didn't look how they did, right? Rather, prophet Jeremiah, in no uncertain terms, goes on to declare to Judah, the ancient people of God, that just as there is no desire on the part of either the eye-catching leopard or the black and beautiful Ethiopian to change either spot or skin, so there is no desire on the part of Judah to change from her sinful ways. And for that very reason, God's punitive judgment will be both soon and certain. It wasn't that Judah couldn't change. Otherwise, what would be the point of God talking to them, right? The point was that Judah wouldn't. And so his, what God is saying is, would the leopard change their spots? Would the Ethiopian change how they look? No. Like that's what makes them part of who they are. It's part of their identity. And he says, sin is part of your identity, Judah. So the only translation that even implies that that's an option that I could find is Young's literal. Doth a Cushite change his skin and a leopard his spots? So this is the value of translation committees that are diverse. Committee versions have advantages and disadvantages and it's helpful for us to know what they are. They can consider the minority opinions. They can decide if they make sense. Disadvantages, they can also suppress minority opinions. But the diverse committees allow for the possibility of those minority opinions. They allow for minority groups to say, well, maybe we should reconsider this. So no committee ensures the bias is going to go away, but it does allow for some of those more unique translations. So that's why I think we need to look at both. 
Individual translations can ensure diversity because the translators can translate it however they want. But it also ensures bias because translators are going to be very biased. Committee translations guard against that bias and can incorporate the diversity as well. So I think it's helpful then for us to know about each Bible's background. We want to know about the Bible that we are reading so that we can understand what biases are involved in it. So here we go. You ready? Here's the list, the master list. Committee versions are the King James, the New King James, the ESV, the NIV, the NASB, the RSV, the New RSV. There's a few other ones, uh, but they're not, they're not used all that much within our community. These are really the main ones. Those are the committee versions. Use these. This is the individual versions. Young's literal, Green's literal, Rotherham's, the Living Bible, the Message, Darby. Oops, <laughs> there, <laughs> there they are. These are these are the different ones that we want to use. And when I put them all up on the screen, I think that's a really good idea. Use them all. You know, check them all out. I recently had someone talking to me about how frustrated they were that our community continues to teach from the King James. And they said, I'm so frustrated because my child comes, you know, here's these King James things and they don't understand the language. Okay, now I think that's a legitimate, it's a legitimate frustration that your kid doesn't understand. But I also think, you know, kids can learn. They said, the solution for this is we should get rid of the King James version entirely. And that made me really sad because I think that's really a mistake. So I, I want us to look at this slide and as we, as we really conclude all of this to, to understand, you know, what do we make a Bible translation? I hope that what we can come out of this is we can come out of it with a balanced understanding that yes, there are flaws in the King James, but there's also benefits to it. Yes, there's flaws in the message, but there's also benefits to it. The point is, is that if we say, oh, I'm only ever going to read out of the NIV, that's just dumb. Like that doesn't make any sense. There is no reason to do that because that's like saying, oh, you know, I'm going to choose this one history textbook and I'm only ever going to read out of that. And if any other like history source ever contradicts it, then it's wrong. But that doesn't make any sense. Nobody would think that way. But when it comes to Bible versions, we get like that. You know, we have the ones that are good and we only use those, right? Or we'll just say, well, I'm a King James guy, King James only forever. That's not right. Or we'll say things like, get rid of the King James. No, don't get rid of the King James. <laughs> Use them all. I think that's, that's the idea. We are so blessed to have all of these versions. And so what we need to do is not trash some and use some of the other ones. What we need to do is understand what are these versions about? How can I use the King James to understand the gospel message better? How can I use the message to understand the gospel message better? Because all of these are tools. And if we forget about some, decide not to use them, that's really just our own loss. So I hope that that's where we can uh, wrap it up. It's been fun, seven weeks together. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for, for going along with it. I know sometimes it's been deep and intense and probably a word that I, I have people tell me sometimes is esoteric, <laughs> but I, I, I have very much enjoyed it. And I hope that you have been able to take from it a little bit of excitement about Bible translations. This is not, this is not something we need to get mad about. You know, we don't, we don't need to say, oh, you know, curse those modern versions or curse the old King James. We don't need them. 
this is something that we can be thankful for. The fact that we have all of these, you know, we should, we should be dancing around on the tables because so many generations would have wished that they had all these translations. You know, generations would have given their lives to have translations like this. So this is really, really a positive thing. All right. That's it, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you.